Um, I, uh, let's see here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Put the chat box down. Well, I. Uh, Bill had said that I had presented with, at the UAV conference. This particular presentation is actually, uh, I'd say, 85% Sunny Ramaswamy's. <laughs> I left it pretty much alone, but I changed a few a few things and I added uh, some examples from grants we have funded. I put four examples there at the end. He has some fruit crop, uh, uh, specialty crop examples at the front part. Um, Basically, uh, NIFA is a granting agency, uh, anything agriculture. I, I happen to work with uh, the programs that deal with agricultural engineering, biological and bioprocess engineering. Um, I'm also uh, half, uh, shall I say, uh, one half of the national program leader on uh, the Agorability Project, which um, uh, it's, a, it, it's an extension and outreach program that uh, allows access to these assistive technologies for disabled farmers and veteran farmers. Um, and two NSF collaborative programs. One is the uh, National Robotics Initiative and the four Examples I'm going to show you are out of that. Then the uh, CPS or the Cyber Physical Systems, which is broader but actually marries uh, sensing, data analytics, and uh, robotics can be a subset of that. And we have ha we have actually funded one or two uh, grants last year that have uh, robotics within it. Uh, the uh, just a little heads up, the, uh, uh, the grant proposals are due March 6 for that. So if you know anybody, just if, if somebody uh, wants to apply, just Google NSF um, CPS and the uh, request for applications will come up. So anyway, I'm going to get started here. And uh, first of all, my disclaimer, I'm an engineer. so. A lot of the genetics related stuff at the front, uh, I will have limited depth of knowledge in. So I'm going to go through this thing as uh, best I can. Okay, smarter farming. There we go. I, I think Sonny putting the nutritional security page up here is a very good one. It's not just food security, which involves production and access, but the nutritional value is very important. And a lot of the uh, projects we fund deal with uh, increasing that nutritive value. You know, an extreme case may be uh, some of the uh, foods, bean, beans, for instance, that are um, consumed in Africa. We want to increase the iron content. We have beta carotene uh, levels, these kinds of things are uh, involved in what we're working working on. I like this slide. I actually added that little continuum slide on the left there, which I think is a pretty good representation of the, all of the aspects, environment, society, economy. Um, all of these are important. Environmental degradation, I think people don't always realize that that when we uh, when we help the environment, we're also helping the bottom line. I'll give you a good example. You have um, you know, precision agriculture, okay? Uh, basically, you attempt to apply inputs only where they're required. You know, what that can do, uh, let's say it's, uh, it could be pesticides, fertilizer, what have you. If, you, if you're putting uh, less pesticide down, only you know, in, in, in the areas that may be needed, you, know, you have higher weed populations here, or you have uh, uh, 
in, well, typically insect management is a little more complicated. But anyway, the idea uh, with nutrient management, nutrient management may be the best example. So you're putting less down, you have less of an environmental load, and you're saving on chemical and you're saving on cost. So um, it all works together. And we've got um, smart systems and big data. I'm going to discuss a lot of that kind of thing. And these are some of the uh, factors involved. And I'm going to show you some, some examples of smart systems. And those technology challenges, I, I like this one uh, Sunny has, scale neutral technologies. There are a lot of things that work for large fields that may not work as well on small, uh, you know, small producers and vice versa. So um, you know, we try to come up with the uh, best mix of technologies. Uh, extreme values, weather, uh, I would say climate variability, we have to, uh, you know, what I'd rather call it climate variability because these are the things the farmers have to deal with all the time. A lot of their management decisions, or most of them, are directly affected by the prevailing weather. And uh, finally, robust technologies. We need to come up with um, robust technologies and smart technologies. There are a lot of Differences, plants as they grow, they have different requirements for uh, nutrients, water, and these kinds of things. Different stages of the crop's growth, they're more sensitive to uh, water stress, for instance. So we have to come up with these uh, systems. So basically, this is what we're after. We want um, newer, improved, engineered devices that properly sense, reason, and respond. And it sounds like a cyber physical systems problem, and it actually is. Okay, I'm going to give you an example uh, on, uh, let's say, caneberry production, blackberry or raspberry breeding. Uh, the genetic aspects I'm going to put up there and not going to explain a whole lot, but uh, you'll see where this is going. So, smart systems. This is a summary of what we can do. We can measure plant performance. We can, uh, you know, uh, growth rate, yield, these kinds of things. Environmental, tracking environmental conditions. Now, as you go through here, think about all the data that is required in this. You know, when you have uh, weather weather monitoring, you have multi, you may have, I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. You may have imaging, uh, 3D imaging for plant structure, determination, all kinds of different pieces of data here. And then real-time decision-making or near real-time decision-making. Um, down here at the bottom left, uh, we're design of sensors, robots, and drones. Now, drones can be classified as robots if they're totally autonomous. And uh, some of our uh, uh, grants, some of the grants that we fund deal with that. We have field production um, issues, uh, precision planting. We have funded projects for robotic pruning for vineyards, these kinds of things. Robotic weeding. Now, that's we we funded a project uh, for I believe this is a great grape uh, production. Uh, or grape or blueberry, I'm not sure which. It would be really interesting if we could get this out in the commodity crop uh, zone. Uh, but you have to get the weeds early because if you wait, that robot's going to have to be pretty strong to uh, <laughs> get those weeds out. So, uh, so we want, okay, you have the sequencing and sensor technologies, high throughput phenotyping. Now, the gene is, we want to identify the relationship between genotype and phenotype. Genotype deals more with the hereditary aspects. Phenotype is the visual or structural aspect. Okay. 
Now, what all I'll say here is if you're interested in this particular aspect is to look up the Ross Breed project. It's, uh, there is a website that deals with that. That's all I'll say about this one. Now, this is a little more along the lines of my uh, uh, expertise. We've got measurements. Plant traits, it's not only yield, but it's in the place, it's taste, quality. When you're dealing with cotton, you're talking about fiber quality. That's, uh, you can have high yield and mediocre fiber quality. And there are, uh, econo there are points discounts for uh, poor, or fiber quality. So uh, we have yield and quality, soil moisture uh, measurements for precision irrigation. Um, and, and I want to add one part here. There's also the social aspect. If, if, if you can't get the farmer to use these technologies, then you haven't done very much. And so there are, uh, we have to integrate that in. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. So, uh, we're using the drones now. <coughs> There's still a place for aircraft, fixed-wing aircraft. I'm not going to say drones are the only answer because uh, in some areas you, you're going to need these uh, aircraft. The problem with that is uh, the problem with those are uh, uh, frequency of flight and things like that. Drones can be put up just about any time. <coughs> Uh, this is an example of structural, uh, uh, I believe, yeah, your, uh, measurements of structure, plant structure, uh, 3D imaging, laser, uh, let's see, height determination, things like that. Okay, so now we get into the data uh, management side. Big data. Or these are these are some of the well these are the basic components of that. Since I'm kind of biased here, I'm going to emphasize maybe five on the right. And look at the first one: uh, predictive modeling. Hey, that got your attention. Um, predictive modeling. I I uh, am interested in crop modeling. Actually, my PhD work. It was more of an agronomic modeling uh, project than an engineering project. This was back in, well, I'm, I'm not going to say when, but anyway, it was a long time ago. And, you know, crop growth models can allow a person to test the effect of different inputs on yield, these kinds of things. A lot of these models are, uh, are verified in the field, and they come a long way. Um, there are models for spray drift. I mean, these are just two examples. There are many different models in agriculture. Drift of uh, pesticide. Okay, you're applying pesticide by air, for instance, and you want to know how far off target that it drifts. Now, that's important because you've got two things going on. You've got the uh, environmental aspects, the respi res respirable uh, component, and then you've got that problem with uh, uh, damaging crops that are downwind, maybe on a, a neighbor's field or something like that. So there are, there's a drift model called AgDisp that has been uh, developed. That actually, you can adjust spray nozzle parameters, you can use different adjuvants which are uh, mixed in with the uh, with the uh, uh, pesticide weather effects, all of these things can be input, and you can get an idea of uh, the concentration of uh, chemical downwind. Decision analytics kind of goes, in my mind, with machine learning in some aspects. When you're talking about adaptive learning, you're, you're uh, making some adjustments. As there is better information, 
adjustments can be made on the front end. Sensor networks, there are there have been many uh, improvements in sensor networks in sensing for many aspects of uh, agriculture. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, thermal imaging cameras. The resolution of these have come a long way for the miniaturized cameras in just the past five years or so. Uh, before we couldn't really use, well, high resolution when you're talking about thermal imaging is, is would be pretty low resolution if you're talking about multispectral imaging. However, uh, if, if you're using uh, if you're using these sensors on a UAV, they have to be small enough. So uh, this is pretty important. Cyber physical systems marries a lot of these technologies: sensing, the analytics, um, and the uh, controlled output. The control output. <coughs> We've got a lot of decision support tools: the Open Ag Toolkit. There are some uh, Android and iPhone apps that are made for this, from this. Basically, we need a lot of education here, and we need a talented workforce to get a lot of this done. <coughs> I want to show you a, uh, I say, a glaring example of a, of a potential success of some of these technologies. There's a farmer in Georgia, actually pretty close to uh, where I, uh, I had my first job in Tifton, Georgia. And um, he farms about an hour to the south, I believe, in Valdosta, Georgia. And this, this guy got a huge yield, uh, corn yield, 503 bushels, which is almost unheard of. And I'm somewhat familiar with what he did. He had a completely integrated system here. And he asked for help from Monsanto and the Climate Corporation for some of the more uh, data intensive applications. He also used some things that many farmers are not using. They're sensor based irrigation. Now, uh, the problem comes in well, what do I do with that data? Many farmers cannot in properly interpret what's coming out of those sensors. So that's where the analytics comes in. And so sensor-based irrigation, you, you put these, you put these uh, soil moisture sensors in the ground. And I've got some experience with this. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, if you properly interpret what's coming, you know, uh, the data from these sensors, you're also allowing the fertilizer to work better because over irrigation will leach fertilizer out of the root zone where it's not very useful. So uh, you're going to save most farmers over irrigate. I can just tell you that right now. So this is one of the few farm managers that actually uses sensor based irrigation. Okay, a couple other things on the right. Uh, GPS harvesters can create yield maps. We've got things on the back end. And also sprayer technology. Uh, I already alluded to that earlier. Sprayer technology to apply inputs only where they're needed. Back to the Caneberry example, we have a project uh, where we have uh, state-of-the-art machines There are uh, technologies called frail bots, which are small harvesting aid robots. Uh, this is a grant from, I will just say, Stav Stavros. I will not pronounce his last name correctly. He's at uh, UC Davis. Okay. This is pretty self-explanatory. I'll just let you read that. So let's get into the robotics a minute. Um, the availability and cost of farmer labor has created economic disadvantages. And so robotics can help 
agriculture be more productive? And many of these robots are used with human uh, intervention also. So I will give you a few examples pretty quickly of some things we're doing. All right, the first, first one, uh, robot-assisted precision irrigation delivery. All right, as you see, uh, water conservation is becoming more important due to ongoing drought and re mainly restrictions on water usage. Now, we're talking about drip irrigation now. So what these scientists did is they developed variable emitters, variable rate emitters, so that every plant can receive a different amount of water. Then they teamed this up with a set of uh, autonomous robots where the uh, drip emitters are, now these are not UAVs, I'm not sure, these are ground robots, I believe, but anyway, um, each, okay, the robot basically has the information based on sensing or uh, modeling or what have you to adjust each emitter. And so the person will go through the field with this robot and attach it to the emitter and it'll adjust it, go to the next one, it'll adjust the next one, and these kinds of things. But these are new projects, by the way. I don't have any uh, output from that yet. Another one, robot swarms and human scouts for monitoring of specialty crops. Okay, now this one does use the UAVs as low-flying, say, co-robots operating alongside human scouts. So these UAVs have imaging sensors, and they can fly between the rows, and that's very important. Uh, Field maps can indicate crop water stress based using thermal imaging, uh, RGB, and uh, multispectral imaging, these kinds of things. And the human scouts out there, just to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to, has to uh, monitor the situation, keep, them, keep the UAVs charged, uh, and relaunch them, these kinds of, kinds of things. Robot harvest aiding orchard platforms. Now, this is from the same researcher I showed you before, but it's, I think it's a very interesting uh, aspect. Basically, all it is, it's a movable platform that allows the picker to be centered on the fruit at all times. So there are sensors, okay, the, the, the person will pick the fruit in one area, then it'll sense where the next bunch is and move this platform. And it really uh, increases efficiency and lowers fatigue. So if you've ever seen them work, they work very fast. But if you have an autonomous platform to be able to get in front of those bunches all the time, you, you can imagine how much of a, a savings that would be. So this is a situation with uh, humans and robots working together. Multi-purpose robot sampling to optimize crop production. This is out of Georgia Tech. Basically, this one attempts to uh, locate where you can get the best, the high value data, okay? Uh, this can all be found online, I believe. Well, let's see, this one, yeah, this one was funded in 2015, so it's, it's up there. And again, you're monitoring variables several variables, and you can target leaf and soil samples using this robotic sim system. You can't, you can't take leaves or soil or soil out of every location in the field. So this, this system targets where the sampling should be done for more intensive analysis. So that's basically where we are. and. Uh, I'm putting this last slide up. Sonny had this also, humans matter. So we're talking about uh, uh, robots working with humans in many of these, uh, these aspects. And I thank you for your patience here. I had a very short turnaround on this one. Uh, Sonny was supposed to, supposed to um, present this. He, had, uh, he has a slight accident during the holidays, and he's at home. 
So I'm the substitute, and I hope uh, you were able to. I appreciate appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, um, and, and thanks for mentioning about Sunny because I, I had uh, 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 failed to mention that in the beginning that um, yeah, originally with uh, Sunny and Robert Swami, uh, but because of the uh, the incident, so so Steve was really uh, uh, very kind to very in very short uh, time to, um, uh, to to be able to do this for us. Uh, is there any uh, any questions for anybody? Um, Right now, okay. Uh, so I'll I'll go first then. Uh, I actually have a couple. So all these projects. Well, first was I mean, the first one is that so Netflix is a funding uh, agency. So these projects. So so like Netflix will have uh, like set the program and, and kind of determines its its uh, needs or its um, uh, goals. And then there's a then release solicitation uh, to for responses to address those goals and then proposals and you know so is it generally like that so all these projects are toward contributing towards some uh, agency goal that being set yes. You know, right? yes we set the goals and we adjust those each year just a little bit um, uh, and this particular set is. Uh, this set of grants that I showed you are out of the National Robotics Initiative, where uh, you know, we collaborate with the NSF. I think it's gone back several years, maybe five more years, uh, and Dan Schmolt was involved in this. And um, we also have the Cyber Physical Systems one. Now, now the the traditional agricultural engineering. Some of these can be uh, sent to that program also, but that's a very broad uh, request for applications. So basically, we we look at uh, some of the up-and-coming technologies. We get opinions from stakeholders as to what we should be emphasizing, things like that. Um, we're not in a vacuum, basically. So that's where the mm -hmm. collective portion comes and that and also interagency collaboration uh, cooperation and exposure well like me being with you guys uh, with mm -hmm. the ESIC program it's been right. educated and so uh, I'm always trying to uh, we're always trying to uh, find new things to work on sometimes we just take the request for applications and uh, tweak them a little I'll give you an example the, the National Robotics one, last year it was um, a human slash robotic interface. Now it's multiple robots. We're interested in um, grant proposals to deal with uh, swarms of robots. Oh. And so that, that was changed from the first year. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, what comes in this time. Um, so that's basically how we do it. So it'd be like an application uh, uh, other than what they use for the Super Bowl. Yeah. Oh, no, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that was the first uh, for, for the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I hope so I, this makes some sense. There are some areas uh, that, w that were not really in my wheelhouse, as they say, but there were some that were. So uh -huh. I had to get this thing done pretty fast uh, and I, I think I think Sonny uh, I think Parag asked me this morning are you going to tell jokes like Sonny does I said no it doesn't look like it so. <laughs> so, so so far has any of the programs or solicitation dealt with uh, focus on data data management you know in that no, area they it in a broad sense the ag engineering one relates uh, talks about emphasis on that. Um, cyber physical systems one uh, does, I would say, the most of all of them. Uh, that's a big part of uh, that particular solicitation. So uh, I'll have to look again to see. Uh, well, now, now I, I must say that 
that one, we have been involved only one year. This is only the second year for the cyber physical systems collaboration with NSF. So uh, uh -huh. on the front end, I'm handling both of those now. Uh, we were going to have another uh, position open. It deals with big data. Uh, not sure if we'll fill that. So mm -hmm. at least handling a lot of different things. So, so do you have currently a, like a list of projects that are related to data that, that have been funded? Well, we have, well, let's see. Um, you know, that's a good point. I, I don't think by itself, uh, you know, we have it as part of a larger project, things like that. But, you know, we just had a data summit, a NIFA data summit earlier in mm -hmm. 2016. And, you know, we expect to get more of those uh, proposals in. Right now, the emphasis is on the control, uh, you know, the, the things I am working with. And, and mm -hmm. of course, you have a specialty crops program, too. And uh, big data is, is integrated into many of the requests for applications. So we expect to get more now. We're, we're kind of on the front edge of the uh, the push here, I, sh I should say. Okay, because you know ESIP, of course, is uh, very much data oriented, and so knowing more of what aspect of data and data management that NIFA is focusing on uh, will help in uh, you know finding a common area of interest. Well, I think interest. cyber physical systems program. Mm -hmm. would be the main one that I'm working with. And then you've got, I'm trying to think of other other ones that would, okay. um, yeah, but that so Is that one, a website? Is that a website for the cyber physical system? Like a well, homepage? We have, well, with, we have a deadline on March 6th for the... Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I meant so for the cyber physical system, is there some information online that we can... Oh, yes. Just the look. best way to do it would be to Google... Well, they say to Google NIFA, but that'll get you there through NIFA. But the best way is to go NS, NSF CPS. NSF CPS, okay. That seems to bring it bring up the page uh, uh -huh. pretty quickly, and then you can get to the request for applications. So um, okay. the head of that over there is um, David, David Korn. Okay. Yeah, at this point, just for information, just to find out what that uh, program is, uh, you know, uh, focusing um, on. Readily available. And, okay. Okay. Uh, anyone else has, uh, <clears throat> has a question for Steve? Well, can I mention one comments? more? I'm We're sure. Going a page on our NIFA website uh, devoted to big data. We we okay. had a lot of input, uh, you know, from this. You know, we had a co-digital session with lots of in, uh, lots of suggestions, and uh, Charlotte Bear, who is another national program leader here, she's going to get that up pretty soon. So when mm -hmm. that out, I will send you the uh, link. Okay, great. Thanks. I hope this was helpful. I think I stumbled around a little bit, but maybe it wasn't too bad. So. <laughs> yeah. No, it was good. It was, it was a, you know, a good, uh, a broader introduction to uh, NIFA, um, you know, uh, than what you did at the meeting. So, so this is complimentary. When you don't create your own, you have to muddle through some of it. So. <laughs> can, can I ask a question? This is Nancy asking a question as well. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, okay. So, so Steve, what, what, can you talk a little bit about what kind of process uh, you see, if you do, maybe through, through, through the agencies to, to get this kind of technology into the hands of of the farmers. It sounds like, I mean, obviously the emphasis right now is, is on research that you've talked about, um, but you mentioned one farmer in Georgia who was who was uh, using systems in 
you know, by getting some funding, some corporate funding assistance. But is is that part of of the program as well to get into once once you know the information is there about the value of them, you know, the improvement of, of production quality or not quality, but um, production levels and so on. It, it, is that part of what you do as well? And if so, maybe talk a little bit about that. You make a good point. The program basically read. Uh, I would say, I would say, unfortunately, the extension component as as it should be. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now there are extension-based programs. Now my director actually was an extension person, so he's 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 pretty high on that. Uh, I'm. This is one of those things that me being relatively new to NIFA, uh, I, I I was with ARS for nine ah. years before I came mm -hmm. here. Uh, fortunately, for an ARS lab, we had a very close relationship with the farmers. I, I actually had some commodity grants, which many ARS researchers did not have grants, but I did. And where the the audience at our meetings were farmers, basically. Ah, huh, interesting. And I worked with aerial uh, aerial applicators too. We presented our uh, research on. Uh, yeah, spray application research directly to these applicators, and, hmm. and, and of course Mississippi State had the extension division. So I'm I'm pretty sensitive to that. I I think some extension related programs I'm involved with. This is a research only one. Okay. And to be honest, we have had some people who had some extension components. Grants were not put through because of the rules we have in the RFA, and so um, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I actually think we need to change that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, uh, I mean, especially if it's it's working that well to improve production, it would it would be, I would think people would be uh, right. you know, interested to to use it. Program, but now, now that, that's not to say you can't have some outreach in there. It just has to be tricky. It has to be masked. But we reviewers typically like that. You know, when mm. these if the reviewers of these proposals would be biased towards uh, one that has that. Anyway, that that's another can of worms. But I I will take your question. And keep it in mind. It's uh, very much along the lines of the way I've been thinking. Yeah, great, great, thank you. Hey Steve, uh, just to follow up a little bit on the various programs that you know NIFA does and funds, do, do you guys um, support capacity building in any way? Yeah, uh, well we have what's called capacity grants, is, you know, where we we have set funding we send to universities. I guess you already know that. But that's the Hatch and McIntyre Stennis and all of these. And these are just sent to uh, the universities as not competitive funding. Um, and uh, I base uh, one of the functions we have over here are to review the uh, review the Hatch proposals. From the faculty, and we give, we do read them. Uh, of course, you're not in the in in the agriculture area, but I will admit that the reviews are quite varied. I'm I'm pretty much a stickler, you know. I don't want someone sending me a proposal that's been written over lunchtime or whatever, and you know. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but but anyway, yeah, we we give uh, hatch. You know, we give money to universities for the uh, research and extension. Uh, but these are only for universities, right? Uh, yes, for that, yeah. yeah. We have some grants that allow, uh, okay, well, I didn't mention this, the SBIR program, which you're probably familiar with, but the small uh -huh. business grant. Right. We have a separate division for that, and 
typically the the, uh, the people who are proposing uh, will interface with the university. Typically, they don't have to, but they interface with the university. And um, these these funds are directly uh, are given directly to the small businesses. Mm. Um, okay, that's a sense in a sense. Um, so uh, yeah, the um, capacity we we have some requests for applications that allow uh, allow money to go to universities uh, companies you know it's they're pretty broad the ones I deal with are a little more restrictive on that uh, mm -hmm. they are research yeah, yeah. get on the a NIFA web website you can find all of the requests for applications for mm -hmm. every, every program and if you click okay. on and you, you can find out uh, who are eligible. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. A any anybody has uh, has any other questions for Steve? This is Nancy again. I put the link to the Cyber Physical Systems website that I found in the notes. So for people oh, great. who want to see that, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, definitely want to take a look at that later. Um, well, if not, then in the last few minutes we have, uh, I just want to, um, and 